Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. It's one of the most remote places on Earth, but an island with a magic all its own. There's something very strong here, and you can feel the spirit of this place. But the more we learn of Easter Island's bizarre, violent history, the more intriguing its mysteries become. It's a place that when you look at it, you think, how in the world did they do that? How did they get there? How did they build those statues? It's an island lost in time, caught between fantastic remains of the old and rapid intrusion of the new. The natives call it Rapa Nui, the navel of the world. European explorers who stumbled across it by accident on a stormy Easter Sunday in 1722 gave it a more Western name, Easter Island. What makes Easter Island one of the most mysterious and controversial places on Earth is its statues, multi-ton megaliths strewn across the island's 60 square miles. Easter Island is growing and to become one of the most uh, popular mystery stories uh, in archaeology. And uh, the main reason is probably that you have these enormous uh, stone heads on the loneliest uh, inhabited island in the world. And that invites all these crazy theories. How did they get there? And what did they signify? I think the controversy has been one that is in part due to the absolutely spectacular nature of the archaeological remains, to the perceived isolation of the island. It's out there in the middle of the ocean by itself. It's lost in a sea of blue, located nearly 2,300 miles west of Chile and 2,500 miles south of Tahiti. More water surrounds Easter Island than any other piece of land on Earth. But that isolation is changing. Every day, a plane arrives, transporting archaeologists and adventure tourists. They come to the island for the same reason that explorers sailed here 200 years ago, to solve the mystery of Easter Island. The questions beg for answers that have yet to be fully explained. How did a native people come to live here? And what is the mysterious story behind the gigantic statues that keep a quiet watch over all that goes on here? The first Western eyes to gaze upon the island arrive on a handful of Dutch sailing ships that splash through the turbulent waters of the South Pacific. Led by Admiral Jacob Rogovy, the sailors seek new territory and riches for the Dutch West India Company. An uncharted crag of land appears. It seems barren, yet shrouded in the early morning light, it's almost mystical. In honor of the religious holiday, the sailors give the place a name, Easter Island. First contact is made. A lone native paddles a leaky canoe out to the ships. His visit is no surprise to the well-traveled sailors. Other Pacific Islanders have greeted them before. But this native is in shock. He has never seen a ship so big, and he has never seen anyone other than the people living on his own island. They hoisted him aboard and his canoe. They gave him a glass of wine, which I'm sure he enjoyed, and some food, and he danced for them and sang for them and talked to them and walked up and down the ship and looked at it very closely, touched everything, the ropes, the cannon, the wood, and so forth. And then they put him in his little canoe and they put the canoe over the side and he waved a cheery goodbye and went back to the island. Encouraged by the man's friendly manner, 140 Dutch sailors go ashore the next day. 
they are surrounded by thousands of enthusiastic islanders. For the Rapa Nui natives, it is as if gods have dropped from the skies. For the sailors, it is the most frightening experience of their voyage. Few people wear clothes, though most appear well-fed and prosperous. They are unlike any other natives the sailors have seen. The sailors report some are brown, others red, some nearly white. Many have tattoos of strange birds and beasts. Some of them wear tall and white skin with red hair, with the big uh, plugs in extended earlobes, and that they seemed to have a, a higher rank in uh, the so society and to be those who were most devoted to the status. What most captivates the sailors are the baffling, huge statues, called moai by the natives, that stand guard over the village. The islanders appear to worship these mysterious sculptures in a kind of frenzied religious ceremony. Before the Dutch can explore more of the island, the ravings of their native hosts become too much. They became frightened because there were too many Rapa Nui people, too much going on. And one of the men in the back of the ranks shouted in Dutch, it's time, it's time, fire. And he did that because a Rapa Nui person had reached over and snatched the cap from his head and tried to take the rifle from his hand. And the Dutch opened fire on that crowd of people. And when the smoke cleared, there were 12 people injured and dying lying on the beach. And one of those people was the man who had come out in his small outrigger canoe to say hello to them. So from the very instant, in a symbolic way, European people reached Easter Island, they began to destroy the culture. The Dutch flee never to return. 50 years pass before another European ship appears on the horizon. In 1774, England's Captain James Cook makes his way to Easter Island after an arduous tour of the Antarctic. His tired crew knows about the island from the reports of the Dutch. The sailors hope the natives can replenish their supplies. They are shocked by what they find. The Cook expedition actually encountered some very angry people. People who didn't any longer look on Europeans as friendly opportunities for trade or gain. There were some angry people there. Cook finds the island in disarray. The crop of sweet potatoes is rancid. Fresh water is scarce. Gaunt natives study Cook's crew with dead man stares. They saw a population that was, to their eyes, absolutely decimated. Looked as if they were living in great poverty. Looked as if they were living on the edge, so to speak, on the ragged edge of disaster. Many of the giant moai lay face down, shattered in the dust. The puzzling symbols of worship during the Dutch visit are now just piles of rock. He came to an island of pure misery. He found some statues standing, but uh, also others uh, fallen. And he only saw miserable looking poor people. What happened, Cook wonders? How could an island people described by the Dutch as thriving 50 years earlier be so decimated? And how did multi-ton statues wind up shattered on the ground? Cook and his crew leave the same day. They have no interest in finding out the answers. They do not want to spend even one night on such a godforsaken piece of land. When we continue, the mysterious beginnings of the famous statues of Easter Island. And we were competing all along. And that competition of the size of the Moai go hand to hand with production. But we were competing so strong that we forgot we're destroying our environment. 
Four years after his visit to Easter Island, Captain James Cook became the first Westerner to discover the Hawaiian Islands. His victory didn't last long. The Hawaiians murdered Cook a year later in 1779. In Search of History will return here on the History Channel. We now return to the mysteries of Easter Island. One thousand years before European sailing ships discovered Easter Island, the first people to come ashore here find a place of untouched beauty. Island legend says a great king named Hotu Matua and 100 of his followers arrive after sailing thousands of miles in search of a new home. These people are ancient mariners who traveled great distances by sea, sailing on primitive but well-constructed rafts and canoes. These people, the Polynesians, were great, great sail sailors, no question. They couldn't have, they had the means to do it. They navigate by using tools like the stars, currents, and bioluminescence, following glowing organisms in the water as they make their way toward land. Elated to find land after months at sea, the seafaring natives decide Rapa Nui, this navel of the world, will be their home. They discover trees and plants can grow easily in the rich soil. Fish are plentiful, and strong trade winds keep the temperatures subtropical. They build houses using the one material that is plentiful, stones from the island's three dormant volcanoes. A religious and superstitious people, the settlers try to give some meaning to their solitary lives in the middle of the Pacific. They find the answer in the island's massive rock quarry, a place the natives believe to be filled with magic. Here they begin to make art from stone. If you are sensitive enough, you can feel here in any time in the day, there is something very strong here. And you can feel the spirit of this place. And you can, you can think of the local spirits taking care of this place. If you believe this, if you live in Akwaku and you, you believe in the old spirits, you can be part of it. They build statues, months-long architectural undertakings to honor the god who put land in the middle of the vast ocean, Tane, god of earth. Artists who design the monoliths believe the phallic shapes of the statues symbolize a connection between the male god of earth and the female goddess of the sky, between their lives and their ancestors. Rapa Nui artist Christian Aravalo has studied the lives of the ancient carvers. There is only two forces. You got life and then you got death. You got light and you got darkness. You got strange and you got weak. You born and you die. The workers that were quarrying here, they knew that. Using simple carving tools, workers slowly chip away at volcanic rock. They start small, but soon they make bigger and bigger moai, some 40 feet high. But no place else in the Pacific do we find statues that large. A very unique feature. Construction of statues becomes the focus of activity on the island. Carvers work day and night on their creations. For them, there is nothing more sacred than making a moai, especially the face. If you look at the moai, the stone carving of Easter Island, you will see the portrait of somebody at uh, mature age with a face full of pride and the attitude full of pride facing toward the village but not having eye contact with the village but rather having a vision over the village like an authority. As the island population grows, families form villages and each village wants its own moai to watch over them. They were family symbols. Every family had its own moai. That's why there were a thousand Moais, a thousand families. 
It's like seeing the different family. When I go to town, I see different faces there. Here, I see the different faces of the different families. They are all different. They got their own design, uh, their own character. They got their own magic. I mean, they look like people, like people. They are all humans, but they are different. But can simple island people move heavy stone statues to villages several miles away? Moving the Moai is perhaps the biggest riddle of Easter Island. If they were going to cut a 200-ton statue, they must have known how they're going to move it. Island folklore claims that once complete, the statues simply get up and walk to the village where they belong. Most Polynesian oral history is metaphorical. It's not literal. It tells us something that happened in the eye of the storyteller, not the historian. We're not talking history, we're talking storytelling. Experts believe the statues, either upright or laying on their backs, are pulled by ropes along a series of rollers and sliders made from tree trunks. Once transported to a village, natives face the daunting task of lifting the statues onto stone ceremonial platforms called ahus. The Rapa Nui people were able to produce statues that essentially didn't change except in centimeters over 32 generations. Now, that's a very incredible accomplishment, and that means that they were able to hand down from one generation to another very clear instructions as to what the statues were supposed to look like. But as the island community grows, clan leaders are not satisfied. A competition begins among the families to build the biggest moai, a contentious rivalry that would lead to disaster. We, the Polynesians, are very strong status competitors. So I see my neighbor making a bigger moai and I do twice bigger. So we're, in a sense, capitalists from a long time ago and we were competing all along. And that competition of the size of the Moai go hand to hand with production. But we were competing so strong that we forgot we're destroying our environment. The entire island focuses on making Moai. Hungry workers eat all they can to gain energy to make and move the statues. Experts believe severe weather patterns similar to present-day El Niños contribute to deforesting what is left of the island's plants and trees. Whether by their own hand or by the hand of God, the Rapa Nui are oblivious to the fact that their island is on the brink of disaster. When we continue, the statues of Easter Island are violently destroyed by the same people who created them. This religion they had was no longer working for them. Elsewhere in the world in 1779, in Europe, Spain declares war on Britain and begins the siege of Gibraltar. In the United States, naval hero Stephen Decatur utters the phrase, my country, right or wrong. And in London, the first children's clinic opens. In Search of History, we'll return in a moment here on the History Channel. We now return to the mysteries of Easter Island. Sometime between the visit of Dutch sailors in 1722 and Captain Cook's arrival in 1774, all hell breaks loose on Easter Island. The native population, once just several hundred people, is now into the thousands, far exceeding the resources available to sustain life. Severe weather may have contributed to the lack of resources, buffeting the land with strong winds, blistering temperatures, and gale force waves. The whole island was impoverished. Trees were cut down, soil eroded, you see, the wind will destroy all your vegetations, your plantations. We reduce uh, uh, a sweet potato, a banana plantation into nothing without trees. 
to help protect the humidity in the soil, to help protect the plant from strong wind, this ecosystem was really fragile. Tribal authority breaks down. Workers are no longer interested in making stone statues. All they want is something to eat. Anything to eat. Food was scarce. There were more mouths to feed. So a collapse almost came to their reality. Warfare took place. It started with scarcity food. Those that were hungry steal from those that have food. There is no wood left to build boats that can be used for fishing. Fresh water in the crater lakes is gone. In a final desperate act of survival, Easter Islanders turn to the only food source available, each other. Cannibalism was a solution partially to the lack of protein. And cannibalism was an indirect way of controlling populations. Skirmishes break out among the tribes. Those killed in battle are consumed. The victors who eat their fellow islanders justify their actions. What choice do they have? But the ones who survive are horrified. How could their gods let them become so evil? Filled with hate for what they have become, they feverishly destroy the symbols of those who are supposed to protect them. The Moai. This religion they had was no longer working for them. And uh, so the work, we know the work stopped immediately because many of the statues were not only being carved, but many were completed and already on roads to transport to the Ahu. Of course, you find some of them being transported on their stomach and some being transported on their back. But they were lying on the old road. Island folklore says one by one, the towering stone statues are toppled, pushed to the ground by as many as 100 Rabanui. The destruction is seen as one way of liberating the island from the curse of cannibalism. To cleanse themselves of their bloody deeds, islanders seek a new religion, one that will maintain a balance of power and resources. They find the answer on three tiny islets a mile offshore in the annual arrival of birds called the Sudaturns. They call their new religion the Cult of the Birdman. And the bird cult involved the chiefs providing an athlete each year to engage in a competition. And these athletes would have to climb down the cliff over a thousand feet, swim out to the island, get the first laid egg, and bring it back unbroken. The athletes are hand-picked by the chiefs of each family. The stakes are high. The family that wins the race will dominate the island for the coming year. The annual competition is dangerous. Fierce winds buffet the thousand-foot cliff at the village of Orongo where the competition is held. It's this incredible ceremonial village perched on the very lip of a volcano in this bizarre setting that is overwhelming in its grandeur and diminishing of you as a human when you see it because it just feels so out of control in the sense that it's on the very edge of your world. In the water, strong currents tire even the best swimmers. Sharks patrol nearby. Some of the competitors never make it back from the race. They uh, climbed down the cliff and dived in and swam. And the one who caught the first egg and came back with it, he was elected as the Birdman of the Year. His tribe will have the honors of obtaining what they will call the owl, which is the symbol of command, with a supernatural powers or strength that allow that tribe to override the rest. The Birdman competition becomes the island's salvation. 
It really was a population mechanism control. For example, if you were a bird man one year and you had to depend on killing some people, you wouldn't kill everybody because you may not be the bird man next year and they would take retribution and go after you. The cult of the Birdman succeeds. Order is restored as each new leader decides how the island's limited resources should be shared. For the next 100 years, the island's population begins to stabilize. Natives return to scratching out an existence from the land and sea. The Rapa Nui save themselves from extinction. But a new and more ominous threat to their existence is about to sail over the horizon. When we continue, slave traders and disease nearly destroy what is left of Easter Island. There are stories of Rapa Nui people who, once let out of the hold, simply jump overboard and swim back toward their homeland, even though there was no hope of them ever making it. Between 1800 and 1850, dozens of European sailing ships used Easter Island as a stop-off point while crossing the Pacific, but hostile natives prevented nearly every crew from going ashore. In Search of History will return here on the History Channel. We now return to the mysteries of Easter Island. By the mid-1800s, life on Easter Island is more stabilized. The Birdman cult helped end cannibalism, and the islanders eke out a primitive existence. But a new kind of destruction soon threatens life on the island. South American slave ships appear from the east, trolling for human cargo. It was called blackbirding, and it was visited upon Easter Island with a tremendous amount of viciousness. Um, it's a very, very sad period. At one point, the Rapa Nui people woke to see 12 ships about to take them into captivity. The slave traders find the few remaining Easter Islanders can be easily fooled. There are stories about the impoverished Rapa Nui people gathering on the beach and the slavers coming ashore and throwing food and trinkets on the sand and when the Rapa Nui people went after it, throwing cargo nets over them and hauling them out. Other stories of Rapa Nui people who once let out of the hold of the ships that they had been taken against their will, simply jumping overboard and swimming back toward their homeland, even though there was no hope of them ever making it. For 10 years, slave ships pillaged the island's population. Islanders are taken to Central and South America to work on plantations. The Rapa Nui people come to dread the arrival of any ships. These slave raids not only brought tremendous physical harm to the island, they brought psychic harm as well. It was extraordinarily demoralizing. In an effort to save the Rapa Nui from total extinction, the Bishop of Tahiti secures the release of slaves and returns 15 natives to Easter Island in 1862. But his efforts only make things worse. The slaves bring home diseases to which the islanders are not immune. And were infected with mostly smallpox and other diseases, infected the rest of the island, and the population went down to the lowest point we ever know of, about 101 people. The massive numbers of dead forced the islanders to change their burial practices. It was once a sacred ritual, drying bones of the deceased in the sun and placing them in the cemetery. Now, islanders resort to using the ahus, the ancient altars of the long ignored stone statues, as makeshift mass graves. That's why today, you can see many ahus on the island with hundreds and hundreds of burials. So this is very important culture change and associated with the, the change in the funeral rites. The reuse of the ahu has simple burial place. In 1864, Christianity comes to Easter Island via a French clergyman named Brother Eugene Irune. He arrives alone, determined to introduce his faith to the natives. Brother Irud is the first Westerner to live on Easter Island. 
He stays on the island for only nine months before hostile natives chase him away. But he leaves a valuable legacy. His teachings take root with a handful of natives and eventually Catholicism becomes the island's major religion. In 1888, another doctrine comes ashore, politics. The nation of Chile annexes Easter Island, which until this point was independent and unwanted by any other government. Chile, the nation closest to the island, is attracted to its miles of unused grasslands, which are excellent for grazing cattle and horses. The lands are turned over to private companies and herds are soon imported turning much of Easter Island into a large ranch. The remaining natives are relocated to a small section of land on the western part of the island, a controversial move similar to how the United States treated Native Americans. Two decades pass. The island's population slowly increases, but little is known of the people and culture. In 1914, the arrival of an unlikely adventurer, a mild-mannered English woman named Catherine Rutledge, changes all that. Catherine Rutledge was a Quaker, born and bred, into a very rich family, well-known family, in the north of England. She was a Victorian woman, and in those days, a Victorian single woman was expected to live at home. But Catherine is one of those women, or was one of those women, that in the Victorian era was called odd in the sense that she wasn't satisfied with the ordinary. A member of England's Royal Geographical Society, Rutledge comes to Easter Island with a simple plan, to do the first scientific study of the people and statues on the island. She believes that science can help solve the long-standing mysteries of the place. She takes detailed notes on hundreds of moai. She interviews a dozen Rapa Nui elders those who still remember stories from the island's past. Now these people lived at a time when their culture had been desperately injured by the coming of Europeans. And so they weren't necessarily the best people for her to talk to, but you know what? They were the only ones left. And she did talk to them, and she kept very careful records about what they remembered. And they remembered interesting things. Oddly, they didn't remember anything about the statues. They remembered their parents talking about them, but they had no personal experience or memory of ceremonies associated with them or any value or importance that they might have other than they are our ancestors. They are the eyes, the soul, the being, the spirit of our ancestors. What the people do remember is a ceremony that is no longer performed, the cult of the Birdman. The elders recall a time before the slave ships came when warriors painted their bodies and braved cliffs and ocean currents to become the Birdman. For 18 months, Rutledge lives among the islanders. She is shown secret caves filled with native art. Rutledge discovers a previously undetected road that runs from the quarry to the statue sites. Rutledge's notes become the foundation for a landmark book, The Mystery of Easter Island. Her extensive field study would spawn a generation of adventurers enticed by the strange and exotic culture of Easter Island. Most notably among them is a Norwegian explorer who makes headlines sailing the world's oceans aboard a reed raft. His name, Thor Heyerdahl. When we continue, scientists debate the question of who settled the island. And they're not made to my satisfaction yet. I'm ashamed of being European because we always think that nobody come anywhere before Columbus and the Vikings. And I think it is ridiculous. In 1978, archaeologists find a coral eye on Easter Island and solve a long-standing riddle that the Moai could see. In Search of History will continue in a moment here on the History Channel. We now return to the mysteries of Easter Island. In 
the summer of 1955, a Norwegian ship drops anchor a half mile off the only sandy beach on Easter Island. On board is a crew of 23 men, scientists, archaeologists, and divers. The expedition's leader is the most famous explorer of the day, a brash 45-year-old adventurer named Thor Heyerdahl. Heyerdahl has a theory that the island's first settlers came from South America. Heyerdahl gained fame in 1947 when he sailed a reed raft called Contiki across the Pacific, proving ancient people had the technology to cross vast bodies of water. Heyerdahl says ocean currents support his theory. In ocean travels, it's not the distance that counts, but the direction of the wind and the current. I think that it is very likely that the first voyages came from South America. One of the members of the expedition is a 23-year-old American scuba diver named John Lorette. First time when I stepped foot on the island, I was amazed. The utter destruction. I mean, no trees, except in one little place. You climb the crater and everything is so barren, all rock explosion. I was taken back completely. Heyerdahl and his team want answers. What secrets could they find with modern archeological tools and techniques? But natives are wary of giving expedition members any information. The Easter Islanders were hiding everything. And they kept secrets. And for them to know something that others didn't know was like having money in the bank. Heyerdahl follows in the footsteps of British explorer Catherine Rutledge and makes the first modern photographic record of just how big the island's moai really are. Heyerdahl spends the bulk of his time gathering evidence to prove his theory that Easter Islanders originally came from South America. He makes an amazing discovery. We discovered a palm, but it wasn't a Polynesian palm, so at that time nobody could say who it was. It's later been discovered that it was that is the chili palm, a special species. Uh, that grows only in, uh, on the coast of Chile. For Heyerdahl, the ancient remains of the Chile palm and other plant life that could only have come from South America prove his theory. Ancient South American mariners must have brought the plants with them. After six months of research, Heyerdahl believes he has enough evidence to support his claim, and he leaves Easter Island. Heyerdahl's expedition sparks a renewed interest in Easter Island. For the next three decades, more scholars focus their attention on the origins of the ancient land. The modern world finally arrives on Easter Island in the 1980s. By 1985, it boasts a new state-of-the-art airstrip. It's a two-mile-long runway built by the United States Space Program as an emergency landing spot for the space shuttle. The new airfield brings more visitors including scientists and researchers seeking to answer the many riddles of the remote island. Most scholars now conclude that the first people to settle the island were not South Americans, as Thor Heyerdahl believes, but Polynesians, ancient mariners who sailed from west to east. All of the evidence that we have as archaeologists suggest that Rapa Nui was settled from Mangareva, the Mangareva area, or Pitcairn. So around 12th century AD, they have route to go from Hawaii to New Zealand, from Tahiti to Hawaii, and from Marquesas to Easter Island. They knew how many days it take to go, what kind of temperature they have to look at to not go too far south, too far north, what star they have to guide themselves, how the sea should look like in a given month. So because they were the real Viking of the sunrise, I believe the Polynesians came to Rapa Nui with full skill of how to get to here and how to go back from here. For years, Thor Heyerdahl and archeologist Joanne von Tilburg have debated the question of who settled and populated the island. People crisscrossed the ocean 
The ocean is the open road for any culture. Exploration is yeah. not settlement and culture building. Those are different things. The Polynesians themselves say that there were two people living there. We can't ignore them. You We've see? got some incomplete archaeology yeah. in the East Pacific. It's a little premature yeah. to begin to look for connections outside of the East Pacific when we're still lacking dates from some very important sites. That I'm ashamed of being European because we always think that nobody come anywhere before Columbus and the Vikings. And I think it is ridiculous. The new airport also brings something Easter Island has never had to deal with before, tourists. The attraction to tourism, it's going to be one of the major industries on the island, no question about it, because it's available. Put this airport now, anyone can fly there. As more people realize they can get to Easter Island, tourists are beginning to take a toll on the fragile ecosystem and the statues. The influence of Western culture is also having an effect on the island people. The materialism came here too fast, and they make a lot of money too, with little effort, so they have the money, so they can buy a lot of things, but sometimes the heart is empty. The 3,000 islanders also struggle to find a common ground with the Chilean government, which maintains a strong presence on the island. There is an unofficial ban on flying the traditional Rapa Nui flag, though some still find ways to defy the edict. Because Easter Island is so remote, some experts and islanders believe its history is a lesson for the entire planet. I look at it as a microcosm of what we're doing to planet Earth. These people exceeded the carrying capacity of land, destroyed their own environment, and I see us on the same track in planet Earth. Planet Earth is another Easter Island. If we are blind, we can let ourselves into a total ecologic destruction of our planets has it happened in Easter Island in the past. I think that we will have no idea of the future unless we know more about the past and learn from the past because all the problems that people have had before us we are going to repeat and repeat and repeat unless we learn from them. I think the history of Rapa Nui is important because it's our history. It's the history of what Western people did in the Pacific. It's the history of how we handle ourselves, we Westerners as a people. And I think very importantly, it's part of cultural rediscovery in the Pacific. Knowledge in the end is what we all benefit from. And history is knowledge. Does the story of Easter Island hold a warning for the rest of the world? Can a modern society learn anything from this last place on Earth? Perhaps the answer is with the Rapa Nui people. They still touch the faces of their statues with a reverence no Westerner can understand. officially ended on August 14, 1945, and the baby boom started shortly thereafter. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. The History Channel is proud to present on home video the episode you've just seen of In Search of History.
Journey through time on a quest for truth. Call 1-800-708-1776 and for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling, receive In Search of History.